Welcome XRP fans. Let's dive into the world of Ripple and XRP. We're going to hear words from Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, and also President Monica Long on an ETF, which they state is on the horizon. We're also going to hear from Monica Long on a stable coin that is soon to be launched. Also, we're going to check out a recent XRP ledger upgrade and look into a new partnership. So if you're an XRP fan, you come to the right place. Please give the video a like and share with friends and family because the more people that learn about XRP, the more people can invest. Ripple has partnered with Clear Junction to enhance UK and EU cross-border payments. Clear Junction is a global leader in cross-border payment solutions for regulated institutions. The partnership will see Clear Junction's facilitating instant and secure GBP and EUR denominated payout coverage for Ripple's payments customers. A host of new currencies are scheduled to be switched on for Ripple's customers later this year. The co-founder and CEO of Clear Junction states that at Clear Junction, we work tirelessly to identify new commercial opportunities to enable us to enhance our existing offerings across the fiat and cryptocurrency domains. Blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies will definitely be part of the core of the evolution of correspondent banking, and we're happy to partner with Ripple to be part of this process. It also states here that established in 2016, Clear Junction services enable quick and safe access to multi-currency payment accounts, e-money accounts, virtual I-bands, and treasury services for regulated financial institutions. All right, XRP Ledger version 2.2.0 is now available and introduces a new XLS47 price oracle amendment. The XLS47D price oracle spec is intended to bring off-chain data to XRP Ledger that can enhance real-world use cases like tokenization, financial assets, decentralized finance, and more. All right, first we're going to hear from Monica Long. She's going to talk about the XRP ETF, also stablecoin, and more. And then we're going to hear from Brad Garlinghouse. I'm going to leave the video with this. Enjoy. Is that there will be you know, more, uh, more influx of institutional interest into the space. Uh, BlackRock has been the 800-pound gorilla entering uh, with, with the Bitcoin ETF and now with the ETH ETF cleared in the U.S., um, I think we can expect to see even more institutional interest in the space. In terms of the, the ETF approval, it seemed like a, a sort of a seminal moment, and there was a lot of talk about institutional investment coming in into crypto. What, what exactly are we starting to see here? Are you starting to see some of the more traditional players wanting to enter this market via the ETFs? I, I think, yes, absolutely, via the ETFs, as well as through tokenization of real-world assets. So that's something we're seeing uh, from our custody customer base, uh, major banks like SockGen being leaders here, um, to tokenize different uh, securities assets like bonds and equities. You mentioned the EPTF. Um, mm -hmm. How significant do you think that's going to be? Uh, will it be as significant as Bitcoin, given, you know, it is a smaller, it is still the second largest, but it is a, a smaller market cap and perhaps not understood as well by, by the retail investor base and even the institutional investor base? I think that uh, the market awareness and education of what's happening in crypto is increasing and expanding. Um, so I, I think, you know, that we can see more uh, more stories and narratives around the ecosystem of um, activity that's de being developed on top of Ethereum. Uh, so, so, yeah, we can wait and see what happens. Monica, I want to move away from the markets onto, onto Ripple because you made a big announcement earlier this year around a Ripple stablecoin. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Uh, so, uh, uh, US dollar stablecoins are a, a major market. So, stablecoins overall today are about $160 billion in market cap. You see projections of this market reaching about $3 trillion within the next four to five years. Um, and I think that's for a few reasons. One is just demand to hold U.S. dollars, easy access to U.S. dollars in various parts of the world. Two, for payments, which has been the, the core of our business for many years. So the reason we're entering this market is we see demand from our customers, financial institutions of various types, um, who want to use blockchain for more efficient global payments and want to do it using a U.S. dollar stable. Um, Ripple, you know, we have a 10 plus year legacy of being a very trusted, compliant, secure player in the enterprise space. Um, so I think we're a great candidate to, to bring a 
a trusted US dollar stable to the market. A lot of people wanted me to ask this question, when are you planning to launch it? Uh, you know, we're working on it right now, and uh, you can expect to see more from us later this year. Uh, so is it likely going to launch this year then? Likely. Uh, have you begun buying the assets to back that at the moment as well? Uh, we're, we're working on all of the things you need to do mm -hmm. in order to bring a product like this to market. So everything from the banking relationships to the distribution relationships to uh, compliance, that's number one for us, is making sure that we are you know, abiding by the rules and regs per jurisdiction and have the right licensing. And, and just the relationship between the stablecoin and XRP, obviously you use XRP in some of your products in terms of the cross-border. If you've got the stablecoin, is there a need for XRP in this mix? Absolutely. We use a mix of assets for, to serve our payments customers, so including stable coins as well as XRP. The, the use case for XRP in particular is as it was envisioned by the original creators of the ledger and of XRP. And that is as a bridge asset for the long tail of currency pairs. And we're talking about tokenization of other types of assets. In the future, when you have new types of assets um, tokenized on chain, uh, having a really efficient intermediary bridge asset to, to make you know any any pair liquid is important. And just a very quick final question, Monica. As we uh, think about the ETF landscape that's happening, we've got uh, a potential approval for Ether. Uh, do you expect any XRP ETFs uh, to pop up? I think it would make a lot of sense uh, if you think about it. Only XRP and Bitcoin have regulatory clarity on status in the U.S. XRP has been a top 10 crypto asset by market cap and is about a top five if you look at daily traded volume. So I think that would make a lot of sense. Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, XRP, all of them are in the green. Meanwhile, investor interest in Ether. Ether's the second most popular digital currency behind Bitcoin has skyrocketed after the SEC approval of a spot Ether ETF. Now, those aren't trading yet, but according to CoinShares, over the past week, Ethereum has seen $33.5 million worth of inflows, which has pushed its total monthly inflows to over $21 million. Pending one last SEC approval, the spot Ether ETFs are set to begin trading maybe as early as next month. So here's the question. Is the dam now opening and could XRP, that's the cryptocurrency used on Ripple's money transfer network, be the next to flow into the ETF market? Joining me now, live in a Fox Business exclusive, is Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse in studio, no less. Oh, let's get to Ether first. Word on the street is that that spot Ether ETF is, is going to come alive. It's alive um, next month, as early as next month, maybe July. Who knows? What I, do you think? I think that's right. And I think it is a big deal just in terms of opening, further opening the markets to more people who want to access it. Obviously, the Bitcoin ETF went live in January and you saw 10 billion. I mean, it took, I think, two months to reach the same level. It took gold ETF to reach over like a year. So uh, the, the interest in this space remains very, very high. And I think the ETH ETF will do extremely well. What do you think is behind the SEC becoming, let's, let's just call it more pragmatic about cryptocurrency ETFs and the approval process? Well, I think the first thing is they've lost a lot in court. And so, you know, they really got dragged kicking and screaming across the line to get the Bitcoin ETF live. And I think they realized that if they were going to drag their feet and fight around the ETH ETF, that likely the same outcome was going to happen. And I mean, it's frustrating that we have to go through the courts to get those positive outcomes. The United States should be investing in these technologies. We should be embracing these from a job creation, from a technical innovation. And unfortunately, this SEC has been fighting it get it every step of the way. I've known you for, I don't know, seven years now. And back then, y'all didn't have that loud a voice. For it sure. It feels like you do now. So what about an XRP ETF? You were speaking at the Consensus 2024 conference just a week ago. And right. you said, inevitable, not just for XRP, but Solano and Cardano, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, but XRP in particular, the SEC has tried to throw you down in court. Yeah. Don't you think that Gensler and company might just say, no, that one, no way. I think it's a hard argument with them to win. I mean, can they make life difficult? They've made life difficult for a lot of people, then they've lost in court. What I was talking about at the consensus conference last week in Austin was that people don't want just exposure to one commodity. So if you have exposure to gold, you might want exposure to silver. If you have exposure to other commodities. And so to me, it only makes sense. You don't want to have just a single threaded uh, asset exposure. So I think people also forget that it wasn't that long ago 
before the SEC got involved that XRP was the second most valuable digital asset. And that was before the SEC kind of anointed ETH. Then they couldn't answer the question, is ETH a security or not? And now they've approved the ETF. They, they, they contradict each other. It's very diff contradict themselves. It's very difficult to follow. Let's not assume that all our investor audience understand what XRP is. XRP sure. is the token or the coin that Ripple, which is a money transaction site, right, that is charged, right? Yeah. You, you get paid in XRP, but it's, it's become something that people can also buy whether they use the Ripple blockchain, right? Correct. So XRP is a digital asset, not that dissimilar than Bitcoin or ETH. There's different characteristics of each asset. Bitcoin has really become digital gold and has thrived because of that. ETH, there's a lot of excitement around the smart contracts capabilities. XRP is extremely fast on a per transaction basis and extremely inexpensive. People talk about gas fees and transaction costs of some other tokens. Ripple uses XRP as part of our technical stack to do cross-border payment flows. And, and you charge... You charge whoever is moving the money Correct. What, point zero 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 one of XRP, which stands around 51 cents or something right now. But here, here's my question. Right now, the main competitor in that space is SWIFT. That, of course, is the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transactions. That's the global one that a lot of people use. They charge much more, do they not? Yeah, they really are the dominant. I mean, SWIFT has been around for, you know, 50, 60 years. And the frustrating part for all of us as users of SWIFT is that it really hasn't changed in 50 or 60 years. The architecture of how it works, it means it's slow, mm -hmm. it's expensive, and frankly, it's quite error prone. Uh, some studies have shown that about 6% of all SWIFT uh, attempts to wire a SWIFT uh, transaction end up in errors that bounce back and Oof. that it takes days to get it back. What about you guys? Well, the, an XRP transaction and a payment flow for us is really real time. It's instant, it's mm -hmm. cross border. And the really powerful thing for a lot of our customers is they don't have to pre fund accounts because our customers are financial institutions. And the way the SWIFT works, you're pre funding, you have dormant capital sitting in other banks around the world using XRP, using RippleNet, our payments network. You don't have to pre fund. When we look at uh, this, this suddenly coming alive cryptocurrency, at least in the past week or so, so now we've got Bitcoin back above 70,000. Some people are making the connection between that and the Roaring Kitty re-entry into the world, reactivating his account on Reddit and saying he owns $115 million worth of, of GameStop shares. Do you, do you see any connection between his sudden emergence and all of the cryptos moving higher, like a meme stock feel back in 2021 where people were also diving into crypto. Yeah, I think this momentum is really driven from what's happening on a political basis. And it, the United States remains the largest economy in the world and it has been kind of backwards as its approach to cryptocurrencies. You know, countries like the UK are way ahead, Japan, Singapore, Switzerland. I mean, we are really behind the rest of the and world. And Ripple has offices in many of those cities. We do. We have uh, 14 offices around the world. And so for me, I think what's really driving the momentum right now is seeing that you even said this earlier, that the voice of crypto, the voice of Ripple and is really gone up in the conversation in the United States. I think you're seeing shifts. Well, some of that is money. You yourself, over the past two years, have given a total of $50 million to Fair Shake, the lobby firm that cryptocurrency people are, are really kind of filling the coffers there. And suddenly you have Donald Trump saying, I'm the crypto president. You have Joe Biden making some noise about, you know, come on, lay off the regulations a little bit. You guys suddenly have... A voice. You're you're the kitten that roared in a way. Yeah. So I think it's less about the Rory roaring kitten and more about hey, you finally you're seeing some of the political the political machinery in the United States move and act. And look, we haven't yet seen the Biden administration. They, they've said some things, but they haven't followed this up with actions. You have seen Trump make this part of his campaign. I think it's incredibly smart and incredibly strategic. This is a topic that has a lot of passionate people. Mm -hmm. And this is yeah. an excitement and enthusiasm that are pro-innovation, pro these technologies, and know that they can be used in ways to protect consumers all at the same time. I think it's crazy that it ever became a partisan issue, but I think that the Republicans are being very strategic in how they're approaching that, and I think it's becoming an election issue, which I think is good for the industry, and thus I think it's driving some momentum in the market. Brad, we'll be watching. Uh, okay, XRP ETF. When? I think we're going to see it, uh, I think it'll probably be 2025.